Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Milene Aguiar from Thornton International. Julian Thornton and I will be hosting this meeting today. And welcome Dave. Thank you for coming. And if you want to introduce yourself and start whenever you want. Thank you Milene and, and Leo and thank you for inviting me to present to this uh, Water and Law Specialist Group. Uh, my name is Dave Hutton. I'm with the firm of SEH Short Elliott Hendrickson in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're having some cool weather. It's actually getting down into the 30s at night now, um, high of 60, but yeah, we're having some cool weather, so I got the, the vest going. So uh, I'll be presenting today on uh, distribution pipe measurements to inform pipe replacement plans. My co-presenter, uh, Michael Livermore uh, from Mueller Pipe, uh, was unexpectedly called away this morning on a family emergency. So uh, it looks like I'm doing it solo. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've got uh, 40 years in the in the business. Uh, that's that's why we got the gray going. Um, 20 of it's in the government sector as a public works director, city engineer for uh, suburbs of Minneapolis and, uh, and in Wisconsin. Uh, as, as public works director, I was directly managing of the, of the uh, water system as well. So I was a water utility manager under as part of that. The last 20 years has been as a consultant. Uh, I've been, uh, for the last six years, I've really been focusing on pipe rehabilitation, uh, tr predominantly trenchless technology. Uh, it's a real passion of mine, and I've started doing that um, in the last four, five, six years. Uh, this project is, is uh, co-sponsored, uh, or, or actually we, we wrote a paper with the city of Edina, Minnesota, which is a suburb uh, of Minneapolis. I'll talk about that in a minute. Chad Milner, the city engineer, uh, of Edina uh, was one of the first in the state to start using this program six years ago. So we wrote a paper for ASCE Pipelines Conference and we're supposed to present it last summer down in uh, Nashville, but unfortunately the, the hotel lost power the day of our presentation. So we were, we were unable to present it. I think we're on the agenda for this year in San Antonio, but I'm not sure that's gonna be on with the current uh, pandemic. So we've got this great presentation and this great paper that we haven't had to share with anybody. Uh, Chad could not make it today either, um, so I was filling in him representing the uh, city of Edina. Um, so that's just a little bit of a little bit of a background on it. Um, and like I said, unfortunately, uh, Michael had to get called away, so I will be struggling through this uh, on my own. Uh, so with that, let's get started. So what are we going to talk about? So we're going to really, I'm going to give you an overview of Edina. I know we get uh, folks from all over the world probably on this webinar tell you a little bit about Edina and their water utility, and talk about some of the pipe asset management challenges that they, that they went through uh, before they went to this program, and then talk about their pipe condition assessment technology that they're using, and then really the results. Everybody wants uh, results and what, what, what was learned and some of the strengths and weaknesses. So really, those are, uh, those are the topics that we're gonna cover today. Um, first of all, Edina. Edina is really a first ring suburb of Minneapolis. So if I can take my cursor here, Minneapolis, let's see, right there. Minneapolis is, is compasses about this area that I'm circling. And as you get out from Minneapolis uh, in tiers, uh, Edina is one of the first suburbs to develop along with Richfield and St. Louis Park that's called the first ring in suburbs of Minneapolis. So they directly abut Minneapolis on their Northwest corner um, and uh, about 50,000 population of Edina. Um, by the way, if you're interested, I live right here, right across from Edina in Bloomington, not that anybody cares, but that's where I'm sitting right now today. There's about 220 miles of water main pipe uh, in the city of Edina. Let's kind of take a look at that. Uh, let's look at the growth first of all. So Edina uh, is probably not too dissimilar than other uh, major cities in the uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul uh, in, the, in the United States. Uh, really, the core cities uh, were were you know developed pre World War II. I, I'm kind of a history buff, so most of the cities uh, you know had all their growth in the Industrial Revolution, 30s, 40s, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, but then, uh, starting uh, in about 1940 and, and on, is when the suburbs started developing. People started moving out to the suburbs. Um, so again, looking at my cursor, this is the Minneapolis border right here. Um, this is probably pre, this upper area is pre-1940 development, but then the yellow is really 50s and 60s, 
development in the 70, 70s is this blue. A little bit of infill or a little bit of final development probably in the 80s in this pinkish color. Um, so most of the city was developed in the 50s and 60s. Um, and it's, it's the trends with construction, if you've really tracked it, uh, older cities have the grid system uh, of, of streets, uh, 300, 600 foot box with uh, water main every block all interconnected. Uh, and, and sidewalks on all the streets, uh, you know, tree line boulevards, you've seen those in, in um, urban areas. As you expand out to the suburbs, you lose that. You lose, uh, you lose the sidewalks. Uh, they, they went away. The developers convinced uh, the cities out then that sidewalks was just a waste of money. Unfortunately, I, I disagree with that, but that's what happened. You get more curvilinear streets, more cul-de-sacs, not so much of a grid pattern. And so your water system, you know, is a little different uh, setup as you get out into the suburbs. So that's kind of the nature we're looking at here for your Diana, typical uh, suburbia, you know, type streets, longer streets, not as many cross connections, things like that. Um, again, looking at the pipe, let's look at the water main uh, that was installed during that period in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. And so really Edina, I would say, is um, predominantly residential. They do have some commercial pockets, uh, some really nice commercial pockets. Uh, the first enclosed uh, shopping mall in the, in the country was built in 1955 called Southdale, and that's right in, right in the heart of Edina. Uh, but generally, it's a bedroom community, not a lot of industrial uh, use, some, uh, and some commercial, but predominantly bedrooms. But the pipe was put in in various, uh, no, probably no different than a lot of cities. Oh, let me back up, sorry about that. Um, cast iron, duct iron, some copper. Um, some HDB fees, some other stuff, but generally uh, as, as age, as pipe materials were invented and created, they'd switch to those kinds of pipe materials as, uh, as, as, as the city grew. If you look at just uh, the primary uh, pipe, the red is all their cast iron pipe, um, again, coincided with the earlier growth. And then ducto, when ducto came along, that's the orange pipe. So generally most of the city is uh, cast and ductile. There's some uh, uh, HDPE, high density polyurethane pipe in some of the newer areas, uh, again, as developers and cities looked at new materials as it grew in the 70s and 80s. So some of these newer subdivisions do have HDPE pipe. Again, 220 miles of pipe in the city. Let's look at the growth pattern and the replacement for infrastructure. So at the bottom, you get the age from 1900 to 2070. This is a projection the city made on their asset management program. And a lot of, uh, well, actually, Minnesota requires all the cities do an asset management plan then to, to prepare for the replacement. On the left is uh, dollars going from 10 million up to 50 million, so annual uh, amount for infrastructure. So as you see, the city grew. The blue is new construction, so you're basically putting an all new pipe, you know, up through, you know, going. Uh, it peaked in the 60s and 50s, 60s, and 70s. Right in here, you peaked the new construction. And then as, uh, as you ran out of area, the new construction started to, uh, to go down. And then the second weird, uh, tier is the first cycle replacement need that's in the red. So they started replacing some, um, didn't really get, get going on until after 2000. You can see now they're red, their replacement pipe is starting to climb as you go into the 20s, 30s, 40s. So they're projecting this need. And then of course you get your second and third replacement cycle. Let me take a quick look. So again, if you look at it in phases, you got your build out period, then you kind of got, I guess I would call more of a waiting, you get your infrastructure is paying dividends, uh, generating uh, water, generating uh, uh, revenue, uh, but not a lot of expenditures. And then now you're into this starting around 2010, we're into the starting to replace it. So this was, this is going to be a big program for the city of Edina. So they needed to be smart about how they build, and this is really for streets, utilities, sewer, water, the whole, the whole infrastructure uh, program. So when you start looking at uh, cities, they usually do a five-year capital improvement program. So looking at their 2019 to 2024, um, which is their current program, uh, again, they're in that uh, commitment to reinvest <coughs> section. Uh, they're in that they're in that um, yellow shaded area, and so these are the subdivisions in the five years from 2019 through 2024 that are scheduled for replacement. Generally, in Minnesota, um, your street condition generate is what drives your capital improvement program. I I, I think that's unfortunate. 
I'd like to see the water uh, the underground utilities, which which in some cases are 100 years old. I'd like to see those get more input. But in Minnesota, again, the street replacement program tends to, to drive the projects. Once a city decides to redo a neighborhood, most cities in Minnesota would replace the sewer and water and storm sewer upgrades at the same time and bring the streets up to current um, conditions. Um, so this is their current five-year program. Um, if I could get back to the water system out here in Edina, 220 miles I mentioned, and it, it ranges from four inch to uh, 16 inch. Um, I would say the four inch is generally a smaller cul-de-sac with just a couple houses. They generally have mainly six inch or greater, uh, over 5,000 valves, 2,000 hydrants, and uh, 13,000 water service connections. They have 18 wells. So again, Minnesota, I'll say is a water rich state. Um, most of our suburbs get their water from groundwater. Um, the Jordan Aquifer is a couple hundred feet down and that's where most cities will draw their water. Minneapolis and St. Paul actually get their water from the Mississippi River. They have a surface treatment plant. Uh, in some cases they have interconnects with some of the suburbs that help provide the water to them. Edina does not have any of those. So all their water is, and, and the other, um, I know it's a water rich state, but the other kind of unfortunate thing in Minnesota, of all the cities are separate. There's not a lot of uh, joint planning with water systems. Uh, there is with sewer. We have a, a sewer, uh, seven county sewer agency. So all the treatment plants and sewer systems are coordinated, but the water systems are generally standalone uh, suburb to suburb. They do have uh, interconnects for emergency use in some suburbs in case there's a tremendous drought or a, a tremendous uh, incident where they lose water, but no, generally for day-to-day -day use, they're, they're separate. Uh, most things do treatment is iron and manganese generally because we have the groundwater here, so they have four treatment, four water towers, and then one underground reservoir. So what do they do? What is their management strategy? Well, they really are looking at replacing. So I'll talk in terms of pre-acoustic and then uh, post-acoustic. So um, when they started their program doing street replacement back in 2010, I would guess right in there, uh, one to three miles annually, um, streets replace, uh, and then if, to get efficiencies, they would take care of the sewer and water at the same time. And they would generally look at whatever data they had, break rates or um, conditions. Generally, I was driven by the age. I would say if you're redoing your street and, this, and the water was over 50 years old, they would tend to replace it. Well, as, as many of you probably know, and, and I've uh, read up on this, there's a lot of water main getting replaced in the United States that still has a uh, useful life. But it, it, it seems like, again, the, the practice up here in Minnesota and a lot of cities still do it is we don't want a water main break on a brand new street. So even though it's only 50 years old, let's fix it now, put a new pipe, that way we're guaranteed. Um, so that's generally what they did and their budget that they were able to uh, afford on an annual basis is to replace about one to three miles a, a year. I'm going to share with you some of the dollars that they spend on that program in a little bit, but that's where they started with their asset management strategy. They knew they were uh, at that bottom of the curve and needed to start spending money to stay up with the uh, deficiency in the infrastructure. So before, they generally, like I said, they look at the break history. This is actually a subdivision called Minnehaha Woods. Um, the breaks are all, all those different colors and, and shapes are different years. And so, you know, this is, uh, looks like from 88 to 2010, the number of breaks over the last 20 years in this subdivision. So they look at the break history. Again, the, the uh, engineering staff would present uh, a plan to the council on which area we want to replace this year. It would generally be based on the streets being shot uh, neighborhood complaints, poor drainage, maybe even uh, lack of sidewalks. Edina is very big on trying to get sidewalks back into these old neighborhoods. But then they would talk to their maintenance staff, both water and sewer streets, look for the areas that are highest in need, and then put those in uh, the program. And generally, um, they would only maybe do one area out of three or four as based on what they could afford. So here's a subdivision uh, that they did. Um, 2015, which is right about the first year they decided to look at more data. Um, um, and they wanted to do a pilot project in this Arden Hills area. So um, 
you know, as I mentioned, I'm a former public works director, city engineer, and pavement management is really, in the old days, you used to drive by and, and, and you look at the potholes and the cracks and, and, and determine, oh, this road's pretty rough, what's replaceable. Well, nowadays, they got computerized pavement management systems. You, you can actually use a laser profiler, uh, drive your road, and come up with a, a rating and you know, hundreds of brand new road and, and, and 50 or under is, is beat up. And so you use this technology to, to rate your roads. We can do the same thing with water main now. And so a lot of cities uh, do the road rating to, to figure out which streets need uh, replacement versus uh, a mill and overlay. So they looked at this area, needed road work, and they wanted to look at this technology for their water main replacement. If the technology is there to give the council some guidance on what needs to be replaced, let's go ahead and, and do it. So they gave, uh, they gave this area, they hired us, that was our first year back in 15, to work with them on this project. And so if you look at the break history uh, in this area, those are all, all those dots that are shown so you can see uh, certain roads right here, lots of breaks on, on this particular road and, and a number of breaks here. Uh, so this area looks pretty, pretty bad. There's other areas that don't look too bad. Uh, but really that's just right out of their data you know go to your break records go to your maintenance records and come up with your your break history and now um you know we're looking at doing the acoustic analysis and what and i'm going to show you this in a minute but the acoustic analysis will actually calculate the percent wall loss in your pipe and uh, at the time we were rating them that it was green if there was zero to nine percent wall loss uh, blue, which was 10 to 30 percent wall loss, and then over 30 is red. Uh, we now have changed that. It's red, yellow, blue. I'm not sure why we had green in there um, instead of yellow, but so that's kind of their criteria. So as we rated these streets with the, using that technology, uh, you can see there was some correlation. The stuff that was less than 9 percent wall loss, if you look to the left, didn't have a lot of breaks uh, on these two streets, just a few. But yet the street with all the breaks actually rated uh, red. It had over 30% of wall loss. And so it was correlating quite well with their break history. Keep in mind, all this water main was the same age. And uh, we always say to our clients, you know, age is not the only determining factor in whether you replace your main. In Minnesota, we're going to replace our streets about every 25 years because of the ice and, and snow. And so if you can stretch your water main dollars for another 25 years and do these mains the next time around, there's a benefit if you'll remember that curve on their infrastructure replacement. So there's a real benefit to stretching your dollars uh, on some of that and defer those costs so you can help, uh, help your financing. And so again, this is what the acoustic analysis came, came out of this test pilot study. So we presented this to the city council, Chad Milner, the city engineer, and uh, our project manager at the time, which wasn't me, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, and uh, that's the mayor speaking, but they presented this because every year they got to go to council and get permission to do their street projects um, because uh, they assess some of it back to the residents. So they're required to have a public hearing in Minnesota to move ahead with a street reconstruction project. And at that time it was presented that, you know, we've done this acoustic test as kind of a sample. Uh, we think that we can save some of our water main costs um, and the mayor and the council were totally supportive of that concept and so a decision was made to move ahead with uh, using this uh, technology for future street reconstruction projects to help uh, realize savings on the water main piece of the project. Um, similarly up here I just touched on cities are also using uh, for sanitary sewer they, those they tell have been televising for years uh, but now a lot of cities are basically doing uh, CIPP sewer lining instead of digging up. Uh, our sewers are about nine feet deep here, nine to 10 feet deep, and our water mains about seven feet deep due to the frost. And so uh, by lining your sewers, deferring your water main, now your street project has gotten way less complicated because you're only working on the top two to three feet of the street, you get it done quicker, unless you got some storm sewer and the residents are back into their, into their street quicker. And so that's, uh, the council thought it was a great idea and moved ahead and then directed staff to continue to explore this technology. Um, so the, that particular project, uh, they realized a savings of approximately 500,000 in, in water main um, deferral. So if you look at this map, uh, the color coding, the, the blue mains were not replaced. So complete new streets over this main the green was actually replaced and they actually chose to do pipe bursting as opposed to uh, CIPP or dig and replace. So I commend Edina for going that direction. Again, I'm a 
huge trenchless uh, component. So they did pipe bursting, and then they did have a, a section where they needed to put in a new, new the, the new open cut. Uh, this one could not be pipe burst. There's a number of homes here, I think, that were on wells. They wanted to put in new main and connect them up. So that's what happened out of that. And so the savings by not doing the water main, they realized was about 500,000 using that, that method. Let's take a pause here and see if there's anything else. So let's look at the technology that was utilized. So um, if you've done any condition assessment of water main, there's really three, three main uh, methods. You can do in-pipe uh, leak detection, you know, smart balls and, and other technology uh, where you can actually uh, put these in the pipe and come up with the results on leaking and other conditions, televising uh, on your whole system. These are, um, I, I, I look at all methods, but I'll say these are a little on the expensive side and are, are not necessarily used everywhere um, because it's just, you can't afford to use it on 220 miles of water main. On the other hand, the far right is coupons. Well, and coupons are certainly an option. That's the best way to determine your condition of your pipe, but you can't, uh, you can't dig up coupons. Once you dig it up, you dug it up. And so uh, that's really a, a good method to verify. And actually what the city has done, by the way, when they uh, reconstruct a road and they take out water main that has already been tested with the wall thickness, they will actually take coupons, send them to the lab and compare the actual wall thickness versus the um, um, uh, projected wall thickness. And um, they'll tell you, uh, Ecologics, who does this work, they've done over 110 of these tests around the country. They are, they are right spot on 0 .00 whatever percent within the projected wall thickness. So those are the two extremes. Uh, dig, uh, send a pipe, uh, uh, something through the pipe or dig up coupons and really, the middle is this non-evasive leak detection and condition assessment. So what this does is it does leak detection, but not only does it do leak detection, it does condition assessment. And what that does is uh, tell you the remaining wall thickness of the pipe. So this is the method that we're talking about for um, the technology that's available. And really what it is, is and I'm gonna show you a quick little video in a minute, but there's two sensors. You put one sensor on a valve, uh, so this is a section of pipe you're testing. You put one sensor on, on a valve somewhere and another sensor at the other end, so you're testing that section of pipe. You, you introduce noise outside of the segment with a open a hydrant or, or hit it with a hammer. Um, and then the two re sensors will send the noise back to the receiver. Depending on the thickness of the pipe, the noise travels faster or slower and then uh, they can use our algorithms to actually calculate the remaining wall thickness. You need to have a couple things. You need to know what your existing pipe wall thickness is, and then you need to know, um, you know, the results of, of the sound. The existing pipe thickness, you can get through your purchase records. You need to know uh, the year it was built, the type of material, and generally what class of pipe, and most cities do have that available. Uh, if not, it's pretty consistent throughout the country as far as what kind of pipe was built in 19 you know, uh, 72 versus 1952. They know exactly uh, where the pipe is built in the class, but so we'll make some assumptions that we don't have the class of pipe. You can test about 500 feet at a time. Uh, the one thing about the test is it gives you an average wall thickness over that 500 feet. Um, most cities do have valves within that limit or hydrants within the five or 600 feet. So that's not a problem. Um, the average wall thickness is what you're gonna get. So it won't tell you if it's the first 10 feet or the middle 10 feet or, or somewhere down the line. It also won't tell you is it deteriorating from the outside in, say from hot soils or from the pipe out through the chemistry. Um, but if you think about it, and as a water operator manager past career, you're gonna replace a section of pipe from valve to valve. You're not gonna just take out a 10 feet put a foot of pipe and also it doesn't necessarily matter where you're getting your corrosion from most, in most of our cases, it's uh, external. Um, so, um, so the results, I just wanted to caution everybody that the results of this technology do have some limitations. It doesn't give you a pipe per pipe, just a total from sensor to sensor, and it can't tell you exactly where the, uh, where the um, corrosion is coming from. So Milani, if you could run the quick video, it's only a two minute video, it's a project we did and it kind of gives you a better feel for how this technology works. I need you to stop sharing. Ah, stop sharing. There we go. I am not sharing anymore. Um, it's our first time doing this, so let's hope it works here.
I think we got a friendly crowd. Yeah. Are you seeing my? I am. Screen? Yep, we are. When Metal Transit wanted to assess the condition of their underground water main pipes without digging up their parking lots, destroying their sidewalk entrances, floors inside their bus garage, they hired SEH, who recommended a non-invasive pipe assessment using acoustic technology. First, cruise lower magnetic sensors into a manhole and attach the sensors to the tops of the water main valves at either end of the segment of pipe. The sensors are attached either to a blue transmitter or a white transmitter located near the manholes. Next, we introduce a noise source into the water main by turning on a fire hydrant on either side of the transmitters or by tapping on the water main with a wrench. The white and blue transmitters collect the acoustic signal from the noise source as it moves through the pipe, and the transmitters send the acoustic signals to a nearby receiver. The receiver is attached to a laptop computer, which uploads the acoustic signals from the transmitters and converts the signal into data that can be analyzed later. After the first segment of pipe is tested, one of the transmitters is moved to the next manhole, and the process is repeated until the entire length of the water main pipe has been tested. Back at the office, proprietary software is used to determine how fast the acoustic sound wave traveled through the pipe. Because an acoustic sound wave will travel faster down a pipe with a thicker wall than a thinner wall, SEH is able to identify the average thickness of each pipe segment in the project area. This information can be linked to a GIS mapping system and color-coded to signify each pipe segment's condition. The color coding system includes green for pipes in good condition, yellow for pipes in moderate condition, and red for pipes in poor condition. These GIS maps allow pipe owners, like Metro Transit, to identify the condition of their water main, prioritize any necessary repairs, and plan future maintenance projects and budgets accordingly. Okay, that's good. I'm not, uh, let's see here, I'll start sharing my screen again. All right, let's see. Are you off the screen, Bonnie? Yeah. Let's uh, start sharing my screen. There we go. And I'm not, this is not an effort to promote SCH. I just, we're just talking about a past project we did that uh, uses this tool. And so uh, using this tool now, let me see if I can go, where's my PowerPoint? There we go. So using this now in Edina. So now we're going back to compare the costs and look at how they used to do it versus now how they're doing to try to save on water main. Uh, and then here's the tool in the ground. Uh, you can see the blue and white sensors and the hydrant being opened and then the laptop, so very, uh, very innocent. The water main's in service. There's no taking a water main out. Traffic still maintains. If the valves are in the road, you just have to put cones around them. If you're on a busy street, you might need some aero trucks or something to protect the cones, but the test takes about uh, five to 10 minutes um, you know, per segment, and then they move on to the next segment. Uh, again, as it's said in the video, sound travels faster in uh, good condition pipe then and so are in bad pipe and so um the technology so sch doesn't have the technology we partner with mueller who does have it but their algorithms have been calculated to do this there there's there's other firms that do it so don't get me wrong i'm not trying to promote any one firm but what it really looks at so you wonder well you got a lot of rust and and you know uh, bad bad stuff inside the pipe but what it if it's not carrying any structure so those uh the, the, the rust spots on the internal and external are not uh, carrying any load, the tool does not recognize them. So the dotted lines, which is the original pipe wall thickness, and again, you get that from your uh, from your record keeping uh, when the pipe was put in and what class, so you know the pre-testing thickness. Um, and uh, what this is, hold on, let me regrab. Acoustic measure pipe walls were recorded. Okay, so again, this is just uh, a, a, a look at how many, so again, the key is 30% or greater is when you're going to uh, start looking at replacing the pipe. And so this is kind of a breakdown on 100 miles of pipe, what's your breakdown in wall loss. And so, um, and, and your leak rate um, based on that wall loss. So obviously uh, the greater wall loss, the higher your leak rate. That's pretty, pretty obvious to most people. Um, the results of your of your test are gonna be something like this. Again, uh, installed year is important. You can see this is all 1952 pipe. The pipe material is important. This is spun cast. Of course, the diameter 
uh, the length and the nominal thickness column, that's what you get from your, your age and your um, class of pipe. So uh, whatever class this was from 1952 spun cast using the AWWA manuals and the pipe manufacturer manuals, you know that that nominal thickness on the segment one was 0.48. Uh, the acoustic tool measured 0.46, so that particular segment only lost uh, 4%. If you look down through the rest of it, you'll see 10, 10, 19. The yellow is under 30%, 29 or less, uh, and the red is over 30. So they look at the very bottom one, Windsor Avenue, uh, that had a 37% uh, wall loss. Uh, the way the cities are, are looking at this data, um, if it's, if it's in the reconstruction area and say it's 25% uh, high yellow, they're probably gonna replace it. If it's a low yellow, um, they're probably gonna let it sit. Uh, anything over red uh, is, is critical and they're gonna replace right away. Um, so that's kind of the way you use this, but you need to make sure you have the proper uh, material in the, in, the, in the spreadsheet. The length is critical and then the nominal thickness. So when Edina did this on this particular project, there are a couple of projects. This is Gulf Terrace Boulevard. Uh, again, you can see the various color shades as they went through and tested their subdivisions prior to prior to street work. So let's let's take a quick look at how this broke out per dollar figure, because that's really the, the bottom line. You know, why why would you do this? So let's just give you some typical numbers. So uh, for Edina, uh, the replacement costs of pipe. Uh, is around 1.8 million per mile. So that's just a, a raw number based on bids they've done on, on replacing pipe. Um, their budget, they usually budget one to two miles a year. So let's just say three million is their pipe, pipe budget. Uh, break costs, uh, the cost to respond to and repair a break is about 15,000 per break. It's generally done with the city crews. So it's mainly labor and materials, uh, any other kind of uh, costs. Um, their break rate in their whole network is 0.12. And so that's probably not bad if you're uh, familiar with break rates uh, for water systems, that's probably not a bad, that's for their whole 220 miles. Um, but again, they built that over time. So they have some uh, mains that are older, uh, you know, there, there's a very variation, probably 40, 50 years in the age of their mains. So if you look at the ones that are identified for replacement, their break rate is higher. It's 0.3 breaks per mile per year. If you just look at those older pipes that are in their street reconstruction replacement. The initial cost for the assessment, uh, this is just a base cost used for kind of getting the mobilization and the reporting done, uh, 15,000. Um, you know, it varies, the, the acoustic test really varies on how much you do. Uh, if you only did, uh, you know, a thousand feet of pipe, it's gonna be really high per mile or per foot if you do 20,000 feet of pipe assessment. So it's all based on, on quantity. So this is just the base cost is to do the report and the mobilization. Um, Edina does try to do uh, economies of sale. They'll do uh, up, upwards of 20,000 feet of pipe condition assessment a year looking at their uh, street project. Um, and so the cost per mile is 21,000 per mile uh, of doing the whole uh, pipe condition assessment. And again, 25 years is their planning window. So you, these are kind of the factors that they're putting into their, into their analysis to see if this program is worthwhile. And these are some of the numbers they presented to their council. Um, so if you go back and look at it, the uh, break rate, you know, based on replacement, and then the acoustic condition uh, is, the, is the right column. So you got the length of pipe assessed, length of pipe replaced. So uh, you can see, uh, there was 2.86 miles assessed in this particular example, but they only replaced 1.6. So they actually saved 1.2 miles of pipe replacement. Um, the cost of the assessment has to be factored in or the cost of replacing the water main and then the cost of future breaks. I think, I think the, this chart was created by the city. I think the cost of future breaks there probably should be some number in, in the column for the acoustic because they're still probably gonna get some breaks. It's not gonna be as much I would say maybe a third as much, so probably 20,000 in here probably should be in this area. But if you look at the total cost of replacing all of the main versus saving some, it's 1.5 million versus 514,000. So about a million dollars of savings in this particular example. Uh, I know the city engineer has been, uh, has written some articles for some of the trade journals and uh, this is their sixth year on the program this year. And so there's the five years of history and I know he's a big proponent because he's saying using this kind of assessment tool 
Um, you know, there's, they've saved millions of dollars. I think he said he's upwards to four to five million over the five year period. Is it a true savings? Probably not. You got to have to replace that water main in, in 30, 40 years, but at least you can make your, your dollars uh, last longer. And so really the results are using data, you can actually defend your decisions. And I think I go back to the pavement management examples. And most of you maybe are water utility managers only, but on the city side, you got to look at everything. And so there's data now for pavement management to defend your decision. Well, you got similar data now for your water main. So why not use it to actually uh, present um, to the council or to your board, your utility board, um, and be able to defend your decisions. Uh, you get less breaks. Um, obviously, you're fixing the worst mains um, and, and the ones that aren't, and it might be intuitive if it's not breaking, uh, why replace it? But again, the, the philosophy and the attitude around here is we don't, we don't want to have a new break in the street that's just paved. And so it's more about an education. I think this tool is perfect if you got a subdivision 50, 60 years old and you're not having breaks, but you're you're going to replace it anyways because you got a new street. Use this tool, and then you can decide. Well, we do have some pipe that's bad, and then we have some other other pipe that's good. Uh, but it's really about the breaks. It increases your efficiency of your budgets, which are limited, and it really gets, it's really a strategic planning tool. I think that was brought up in the video. It's not necessarily. Uh, something that uh, you're going to use everywhere, but it gives you a good guide for replacing your pipes. Um, really, uh, staff at the city, um, there's a little lower level of detail and effort to do this. There's very low risk, and it does bring uh, increased asset awareness to the overall program. So it's been a resounding success in Edina. Uh, you know, there's a number of cities in the metro that have been doing it uh, up here as well, but Edina is the one that first started it. Um, and like I said, they've been doing it uh, up to six years. So if you're looking for another tool, uh, again, there's an, uh, a number of companies, uh, I'm sure that, that do this. Uh, we work with Mueller, Michael Livermore, again, could not be here, but uh, Mueller, there's a, a the company is Ecologics, which is a division of Mueller. Uh, and they have the ePulse tool that actually does the acoustic. And of course, my name is Dave Hutton with SCH. And then here's the city of Edina public Works staff who were very supportive of this project. So. Uh, I've come to the end of my side show, so I'm available for questions. And I know we got a chat room going. So, Melania, do you have any questions that you want to fire at me? We don't have any questions yet. Okay. Would you like I do to have the con we do have the contact information up here for both Michael and myself. Uh, feel free to email me or, or uh, call me um, as well with questions. Okay. Uh, we've got a question here. Does main lining make a difference to the results? Does water lining make a difference to the results? Is that the question? Yes. You know, it, um, you, it, it tests metal. So this is a this technology. I, I, that's a good question. It does not work on concrete pipe or plastic pipe, PVC or HDPE. So it's only metal. I know trench us technology is constantly changing and I know they're looking at trying to come up with some. So if you line your main uh, with the CIPP liner, uh, it's not going to give you a true test probably because it, it might go through and give you the underlying results of the metal that's, that's uh, the host pipe, but the liner itself will not be picked up. It won't show you anything about the condition of the liner. And so I'm not sure you'd want to use this on a line pipe. I don't think the results would really make much difference or, or give you much credible information. Good question. Okay. Ian Rogers is asking, how does pipe diameter impact on results? Another good question. And I kind of glossed over some of that. So pipe diameter doesn't matter. I will say that um, the tool is most effective for uh, 12 inch and less for your localized mains. Uh, that's the most cost effective method because they, they only have to run it from um, uh, hydrant to hydrant to valve to valve. If you're over 16 inch, because of the size of the main, you actually got to run the test twice. You got to run it, say, east to west, and then you got to reverse the sensors and run it again. So you got to run it twice, so it gets a little spendier. I don't believe there's an upper limit to the size of pipe to test. I know we've tested all the way up to 24 inch before. Um, and that might be something Michael can weigh in on, but I don't believe there's a, an upper limit, uh, but you do have to run it uh, with this particular tool. I'm, I'm going to refer to the ePulse Acoustic tool. Now there are other 
tools out there that will test larger pipe and concrete um, PCC concrete pipe that we're not going to talk about today. But for this particular tool, I think you're going to probably keep it to 36 inch or less, I would imagine. Okay. Alan Gedan is asking, do acoustics have limitation on big diameter water mains, size and others? Yeah, I might have just answered that question on the yeah. bigger mains, but if I didn't, go ahead and submit a follow-up uh, chat. Uh, is there a minimum water pressure requirement? There is a minimum water pressure. Uh, I believe it's 20. Uh, most of our mains up here are usually in the um, 50, 50 to 100 PSI range, um, but you got to have a minimum of 20. Boy, these guys are sharp. That's a really good question, and I should have brought that up, but it has to be at least 20 PSI. Okay. Uh, how do results handle cavitation and water appurtenances? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't think I can read that. Um, let me, uh, can I read the chat? Let me see if I can see the chats myself. Where are the chats? How do you handle cavitation and water, water appurtenances? I don't know that. I'm sorry. Cavitation. Oh, how do results handle cavitation and water appurtenances? The, the, well, you, you can't test it through, you can't test through a valve. So you're going to go from valve to valve. And so I don't know what I mean. Appurtenance is what you mean by that. But generally, uh, if you got a T and you're, you're going across uh, an intersection, the T doesn't matter. It just, it goes in the direction of the flow. Uh, cavitation, that might be, you don't want your pumps running uh, at the time. And so if you're in an area that has high pressure pumps that kick on and off, uh, you do want to be careful on that. Most of our uh, cities up here, like I said, they got centralized wells that all go to a treatment plant and the pumps are in the plant. So the pumps aren't real close to the neighborhoods generally. But if you do have an area where your pump is fairly close to the work. You do not want to uh, kick that on and off uh, during the test. The test doesn't take very long. Like I said, uh, uh, five to 10 minutes per segment. And so you do not want that pump noise affecting uh, the, the solution. Good, good question. Uh, anyone else? Hey, I got one that said, nice job. Not thanks, one. thanks, Darren, thanks. All right. I think, I think you've got a private, uh, a private note there. Can you test through a short section of PVC repair? You can. Uh, we do want to know about those, though, because it would, uh, you know, it's got to be fairly short. Um, sometimes they'll do a segmental repair inside the pipe, too. We need to know about those. Uh, I guess we would be cautioned with the results. Again, it gives you the average over uh, the 500-foot section. So uh, if there's a 10 foot piece of PVC repair um, on a 100 foot section of pipe, it's probably not a good idea, but if it's a longer section, so there, there is a way you can do it. You just wanna look at the situation uh, and make sure it's, it's, it's gonna go, be okay. And you, you might wanna look at the results a little more carefully, but if we know they're in there, then we can, we can look at that. It, it, the biggest thing is if we don't know there's a, a repair in there, then you get the results and the results look funny. You gotta look at the results to see if they make sense. There's a number of things that affect the results. Uh, the primary one is a class of pipe, but also the footage. You know, we we uh, we get locates and measure the footage on the ground because if you if you're in a, a curvilinear road and you think it's uh, 500 feet and it's only 400 feet because they cut through the corner or something, uh, that really affects your results. And so you look at the results, and if there's an odd looking uh, result, there's all the reds in one area, but then there's a, a green for some reason. You go, wait a minute, that one's probably something wrong with our input data. So, yeah, good question. Now we've got Any some welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Very helpful here in the Philippines. Um, good. Not, not any other questions. So. Uh, Julian, would you like to say anything or we are just call it for today? No, uh, Dave, I'd just like to say thanks very much. I think uh, like everybody else, it was very, uh, very detailed. Nice to have a real uh, project to talk about. And I like the way you went through and didn't just talk about the technology, but also talked about the dollars. Because it's all about the dollars at the end of the day and, and, and it seems to work out. So I think I'd just like to say thanks very much. And uh, just remind everybody, if there's anybody that didn't get to see it today, 
um, this video will be uploaded to YouTube with the rest of the one of specialist group videos and so people can go ahead and, and, and take a look at that um, later on if they if they weren't able to make it today. So uh, with that, Dave, uh, thanks very much. And, uh, okay. Thank you, much. thank you for inviting me. And uh, on behalf of Michael, who had to leave unexpectedly, couldn't present, I know he wanted to do it. Uh, I thank you both. And most certainly the city of Edina, uh, Chad Miller, um, and uh, again, I, I like these presentations. I, I've done them at the Nodig show. So anytime you have any anything, just give me a call. But uh, I, I'm glad you invited me. I enjoyed it very much. And I hope everybody stays safe out there. Yep. Thanks a lot. Thank okay. you, Dave. Stay yeah. safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.